everyone to today's webinar entitled Five Steps to Agile API Security, brought to you by Forum Systems and myself, Jason Macy, Chief Technical Officer. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, the notion of Agile API security and uh, effectively what that means in terms of the baselines of the technology and the understanding of what, what it, it does mean to provide Agile. API security. But first what I'm going to do is start out just by giving a little bit of background and uh, in terms of who we are forum systems that uh, aligns with the uh, how we know effectively what API agile security um, is. Uh, so forum systems uh, we've been around for about 13 years. We're the provider of the forum Sentry API security gateway. And over the course of um, the many years in which we've been in the critical path of complex environments, uh, we've uh, seen the architecture design patterns and uh, needs of data communication patterns that have evolved to uh, require uh, an agile approach to securing APIs. And there are some uh, key aspects that we're going to point out in terms of what that means. Um, and it's, it's important to note in terms of what, we're, what we do as a company is focus on um, this technology space uh, exclusively. Um, with regard to the, the agility of, of API security uh, and as it pertains to identity access control and SSO um, and the security uh, essentials that go into the, the architecture platform by which to, to provide those features is, is the foundation of, of our flagship uh, product in the company. So um, as we discuss uh, the concepts, it's important just as a step back to uh, note in terms of the API security gateway that we provide for uh, is, is actually a virtualized and hardware uh, rendition of uh, a component that provides the functionality around API security. And as we discuss the various notions of agility uh, and security, uh, it's going to be important to, to keep the concepts uh, in, in place about the ability to be versatile and agile with regard to environments uh, and form factors uh, for deployment of this type of, a, of, of an agile solution. For those that may not be familiar with API Gateway, it's, in, it's another important distinction that uh, it fills what we call a white space, uh, uh, an area of functionality and technology in the network that uh, is not provided for by so your traditional uh, architecture components. Uh, it is not a Palo Alto, it is not an F5, it is not a checkpoint, it is not a FireEye. An API gateway serves the actual uh, components of marrying together identity access control and single sign-on with data security. And that is what, uh, as we go along here to describe and, uh, and fundamentally lay out the foundations of API security, it will become more clear that all of those components together um, fill that gap uh, in network architecture to centralize and provide for the agility and a central component uh, around gateway technology to facilitate agile API security. Um, so let's go into it. API security. API security is really comprised of uh, you know, four major aspects of what goes into um, the concept of the security. Uh, APIs are the, the, the entry points into services within an environment. They're the means by which to communicate and exchange data. So one of those key aspects of the security paradigm is an authentication. Uh, the ability by which to determine and, and authenticate uh, a client, a device, a user to know um, who they are. Second part of the API security paradigm is authorization. You know who they are, but what can they do? And that's comprised of two key uh, uh, subcomponents of authorization. Uh, you're probably quite familiar with the notion of RPAC, role-based access control, based on the role of the user, where can you go? But in addition to that, in API security, you also need to bring in the content, the payload, the information, uh, and, and bring to bear also content-based access control along with role-based access control. That gives you the contextual way to, to provide authorization decisions uh, on APIs. The third part of that is 
the federation capabilities. Once we've got a handle on the authentication authorization, there's also the need in API to federate so that we have a unified way. Agility means that we want to have a more unified uh, approach to our security paradigm where it's reusable uh, and sensible to other APIs and other uh, components uh, that are being communicated with in, in the enterprise. Uh, so federation and single sign-on enablement becomes a key aspect of what we want to provide for API security. And then finally, API security needs uh, itself to have uh, the technology be secure. Uh, it may sound counterintuitive, but providing security features on a platform does not necessarily make the solution or platform secure. Uh, in order to ensure a, an agile approach to API security, you must have the confidence that uh, what you're using to provide for the API security cannot in and of itself be compromised. And so it's a critical aspect also of the security paradigm that, that the solution uh, be secure. And so we're going to delve into each of these four areas in more depth. And we'll start out with, with authentication. When we talk about authentication, really the, 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 the two key uh, differentiating points of authentication is how uh, it's been done in the past, sort of the legacy approach versus the modern approach, agent versus agentless authentication. So if we look at the sort of uh, spectrum of uh, technology uh, on the Internet uh, today, it's, it's comprised of uh, quite a diverse set of uh, you know, uh, clients and, and services and, and, and those API communication points. And where the complexity comes in around authentication is there's you know, a, a whole uh, you know, bunch of different uh, you know, formats and token types and, 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 and uh, service variants that, that go into this. So it's, it's complex to try to uh, consolidate all that and, and determine, you know, how do we apply a, a unified theme to, to that authentication? Well, it, it gets further complex if we even just take one, one of these uh, services out of this picture here. Let's focus just on one of these. Um, what happens traditionally is, uh, and, and, and most environments uh, have uh, implemented what we call end-mile identity authentication. So even though your identity management infrastructure that serves the means by which to have roles and, and users in, in sort of one location, the enforcement scheme of that is unfortunately still based on legacy principles of end mile authentication, meaning that you have an endpoint service that provides the data and the information and the business logic, uh, and you have this uh, identity policy server uh, you know, IDM system that, that consolidates users' roles and, and, and policy decisions. Uh, and in order to enforce that, uh, you need to embed agents uh, within those services at the endpoint to integrate in with the, uh, with the services. The developers have to, you know, put in the modules that end up calling back and forth as requests come in to go to any service saying, you know, hey, is this user authenticated? Uh, or not? Is this a valid user or not? And what happens is, is that's fine for one or two services, but as those services grow, it, it, it is, uh, becomes uh, incredibly problematic for many reasons, because this is a non-scalable architecture. The promise of policy server and IDM uh, is that you can centralize your, your, your policy and role-based uh, 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 administration and policies that, that define that. But the uh, enforcement is where that breaks down. And the complexity of those environments and different service variants and, and old and new services uh, really uh, uh, exacerbate that problem. And so this authentication, while required and essential to API security, is mired in issues around scalability, um, every one of those agents making requests back and forth through a policy server impacts hugely on network latency, asking the same question to the same, uh, having the same answer, one agent knows nothing about the other, impacts the CPU and memory or the back end uh, systems in which those are running. You have huge issues of ongoing management. Forget about just deploying a new service and having to integrate modules. How about all the patch maintenance and different operating systems and patch revisions from the identity provider as well as from the service provider? 
Uh, it's controlled all by developers. It's not a centralized way of enforcement. It's you know, plug in the module and hope that you're integrating it properly. So authentication is a very essential required component. It's often uh, accomplished through IDM uh, identity management policy servers. The issue is, is there's a there's a there's a problem from an agility standpoint in that this is not an agile approach. Uh, this is uh, a cost prohibitive. Uh, glass ceiling on performance and scalability, and uh, you know ultimately not, far from uh, an agile approach to authentication. So what we're going to uh, take a look at is how we can frame this in a way to look at rather than focus on the endpoints and specifically, we're going to focus on the tokens, on the identity information itself, and the information flow. So if we take a look back at our sort of more complex uh, scheme and we break it down to really what comprises the, the, the individual token variants, we can now have a more unified approach, a more simplified agentless approach to focus rather on the transaction and the information uh, and the tokens themselves that are going in and out of the APIs by which we can then consolidate the actual authentication and abstract that from the endpoints by which we just simply take all of that into a, a component that can just do that authentication across all those token formats regardless of the type of endpoint, of the technology that sits behind it that it facilitates and is communicating with. And that abstraction allows us to take that first key aspect of API security, which is authentication, and the central part of, uh, of allowing uh, uh, communication through an API and centralizing and simplifying the authentication uh, component of that. So that's, so that's one piece of, uh, of our API security um, uh, model. Next we go to authorization. Uh, and authorization, uh, I'm going to touch upon two key parts of authorization. Let's start with CBAC, content-based access control. When you have an API and information go, uh, coming in and going out of an environment, uh, authorization in, is not just inclusive of go, no go. Uh, it's not just the, uh, what, what the user may, may or may not have the uh, rights and roles to do for RBAC. It also is based upon the content of what's inside of that information. Now here's where it can also get pretty complex because there's quite a you know, diversification of the types of APIs that are out there. Uh, mobile APIs, web portals, you know, B2B uh, trading, SOAP-based or XML-based uh, APIs. And so that information that we want to consolidate and make unified authorization decisions, we need to break that down as well and simplify the actual content from the actual uh, clients and services. So again, what we're going to do is just focus on the actual content. Regardless of the clients, regardless of the services, what's good about this, even though it may seem complex, is that it is rooted in modern messaging standards and formats that are structured formats, REST, XML, JSON, HTML. And so if we take that and compress that down into policy uh, capability by which we can understand these message formats and facilitate uh, communicating with them, then we can change that simply to a content-based access control authorization mechanism, where the simplified ability to authorize now can go across formats, and that we can do our CBAC portion of API security in a more simplified way, regardless of data uh, formats and, and complexity. Now, the other piece that's obviously uh, uh, a core piece of authorization is role-based access control. Uh, so role-based access control is effectively where can you go based on who you are. Uh, and this is sort of uh, challenging in, in, in many ways, challenging in terms of you know, which environment, which API are you actually targeting. Who you are may dictate what, whether or not you can gain access to you know, web APIs, cloud APIs, different, different APIs within the uh, on-premise infrastructure. So that role is a no-go, uh, go, no-go in many cases. Yeah, you, can't get, you can't see you know, accounting data, but maybe you can see you know, some other kind of information. 
And so that's one part of the role-based uh, decision pattern. But you may also have users that for the same API, and this is where it gets a little more complex in terms of what uh, particular users uh, are allowed to see. You know, a, a user on, a, a, on an app that authenticates, uh, we'll call this user, I get everything may have a wide open spectrum of what it can uh, retrieve from, from a particular API. Whereas maybe another user using the same app authenticates and it isn't allowed uh, all, you know, all the things that, that otherwise the, the original user was uh, able to get. And then there's this other user using the app and he gets uh, completely other uh, sets of data. And so we need to have role-based approach. Now in order to do that, we, we don't want again to do these types of things at end mile. So we need to have an authorization decision point that can first inspect the user and authorize based on role as to what the uh, particular user is allowed to retrieve, what kind of data it's allowed to get uh, based upon the role uh, that that user has. Uh, and, and, and we need to do so by way of, of extracting that out uh, into the component that we'll simply call role-based access control. So that sort of comprises now our authorization component. We've got authentication, we've got our content-based authorization, we've got our role-based authorization. Now the other piece of the uh, API security model was our federation, SSO, uh, whereby we want those credentials once bound and validated to be able to be uh, federated, to be able to be uh, uh, extended to uh, to other uh, parts of the enterprise, to other APIs. So from the SSO perspective, what has to happen is as information uh, is, is meant to be submitted into uh, to an API environment, there's, there needs to be an authentication sequence. As we know, SSO obviously is the byproduct of first having an authentication, uh, valid uh, authentication that occurs in order to federate, in order to then provide some single sign-on token that um, uh, that is that the de determines uh, that an upstream authentication or a prior authentication occurred. So that's the first step. We need that authentication. Now, abstracting that out from the infrastructure allows the ability for that authentication to to take some information about that user and 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 put it into that request so that you can provide those backend services with information about that user by abstracting the SSO. In, in some central location, you can still provide information about the user and uh, to that backend service. Now, when that response comes back, that's when ultimately as you've done that initial handshake, you can provide an SSO token, some information, some artifact. And this could be in different schemes. You have SAML, OAuth, uh, cookies, lots of different SSO uh, notions, but some means by which to enable that client to uh, re-authenticate uh, using a token versus the, 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 um, the actual original authentication handshake. What that token then does is gives you access across all different services. So those same user properties that were obtained in that initial authentication by intent, you're not only gaining access through a token, but you're also giving information to all those federated services, all those other APIs uh, that uh, also want to leverage that original authentication in order to know about that user, not only gain access to the API, but know who it is. And that comes back from the um, what we call the necessity to have uh, session management. So to, uh, to retain information about a user that was authenticated such that when the, um, the single sign-on tokens are presented, uh, you can continually retrieve those same user properties and provide the same user properties that you have with the SSO token uh, that, that are necessary for, for those APIs. And so SSO and section management becomes uh, another uh, uh, part of what goes into uh, the API security paradigm. Now that final point I made earlier was the security of the platform itself. So we have to try to provide this sort of centralized way of doing our authentication, taking that out of the end mile scheme, our authorization, our federation, single sign-on. But we need to do this in a, in, a, in a way that ensures that uh, 
that particular uh, component doing that is is secure. Otherwise, you know, we've obviously opened an, another risk exposure point uh, to, to this solution. So some of the key sort of standards and, and, and certifications out there and, and, and concepts around securing the platform. Well, you want to ensure that the policy information and the PKI keying information is secure. Two of the standard industry accreditations out there are FIPS 140-2 and DOD PKI that sort of look at uh, how information uh, from a PKI perspective and how policy information is stored and ensured that it's secure. Uh, the operating system that is running um, this system needs to be secure, and FIPS, again, is another uh, well-known industry accreditation for that. The administration of information on the platform that you're providing this agile security should be secure so that not any rogue element can get in and, uh, and disrupt or, uh, or uh, alter uh, policies that are, are being accomplished for achieving the API um, security. And so these sort of three uh, aspects and, and the certifications therein are, uh, you know, industry um, we, ways to validate that, that the solution has the security. So going back and bringing all this together, we look at API security. First, foundationally, let's make sure we've got a FIPS and NDPP and DOD certified platform dropping in our four components of necessity with regard to authentication, RBAC, CBAC, and SSO that give us that abstraction uh, layer to do all those functions, not at the end mile, but rather in a technology component uh, prior to the end services so we can centralize it and, and unify uh, these decisions, these, these, these notions of API security across different token formats, across different message formats, uh, and with the notion of SSO and modern, uh, uh, the modern SSO notions of SAML and OAuth and, and Cookie Federation. <clears throat> so coming all together, um, what we come up with is effectively um, the Forum Century API Security Gateway. Uh, this is the components that are comprise uh, the, the gateway in terms of an authentication engine, an RBAC engine, a CBAC engine, and an SSO management engine that hooks into identity infrastructure and facilitates that abstraction layer of technology that can accomplish all of those things at a different location in the architecture tier so that this doesn't become end mile point based individual solutions on point services but rather uh, an architectural component in the network that accomplishes API security in a unified centralized way. Now that's one part of it. API security uh, is, is one piece of the puzzle but in the modern era of agile uh, development, deployment, uh, services in the cloud, virtualized services, on-demand services, on-premise services that get stood up, API security in and of itself is one thing, but we, we're talking today about the uh, additional aspect of agile API security. So agile API security brings to bear these central concepts. This is foundationally what you need to achieve API security that's that step you know that's, that's the foundational base uh, now how do we look at this from an agility perspective of uh, API security so let's uh, let's see what that looks like agile API security has some central key aspects key concepts first part of agility is you don't have any code you don't have developers or, 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 or customized coding as a part of your Agile API security uh, uh, paradigm. If you, if, if, because that's non-repeatable, it's not uh, 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 well enforced, and you don't want your developers to focus on security and identity. You want developers to focus on business value and services and what those data services do. So without with not having code a part of your security and identity and authentication paradigm becomes a much more maintainable, simplified, and faster and efficient model to achieve uh, ongoing uh, agility for, for, secure, for the security of the API um, uh, infrastructure. So that's one key aspect. You want to make sure when you're building these security artifacts that they're reusable. If your agility of security is on day one, uh, your security is uh, is presented in, in a certain way, 
those pieces are applicable to new and emerging types of APIs. So we need to make sure that the components of the security model and the policies are, are common and repeatable, they're reusable. And that way, as you publish new APIs, as you bring, uh, uh, as new APIs become uh, available, they can be published with consistent enforcement, the consistent design patterns, and we're going to talk more about design patterns, whereby, you know, there, there is very com uh, commonality. SOAP services have a certain kind of uh, 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 aspect about security. Mobile services, web portals, uh, you know, so the REST APIs, CRUD and, and, and JSON based, these are design patterns that are actually quite similar in nature. And so as the, these components uh, are built uh, and policies are built to facilitate, they can be reused. And that reuse paradigm obviously from the agility perspective gives you significant cost uh, 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 increase, uh, cost effectiveness uh, because you now have invested in those policies that you can simply reuse. Those are uh, validated entities that are brought to bear on, 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 on new patterns. Adaptability to environments. So APIs can be in lots of different locations. The API really represents a means by which to communicate with a data or a service. This can live in the cloud, it can live in on-premise, uh, virtual environments, uh, and so in order to have a, an, an agile approach to your API security, you've got to have the ability to uh, be present in those different locations. And, and, and then in addition, to unify the policy enforcement schemes across those environments. This provides for the versatility and cost effectiveness of you know, software and virtual and hardware when it's applicable. Uh, not out of uh, design necessity, but more out of the versatility of uh, matching the ecosystem and environment where those APIs actually reside. Uh, and that's, uh, the adaptability is important. And then finally, the agility to deploy policies, to enforce policies in automated ways. So that when APIs uh, get uh, published, you can combine the security model along with it. Uh, an automated policy enablement starts then to uh, coincide with uh, API life cycles and elasticity of bringing up and down APIs on demand where the policy and security um, that goes with it uh, can, be, uh, can be automated so that your API uh, security model becomes uh, part of that uh, API uh, deployment strategy and, and, and feeds in thus to the agility uh, of that. And that's obviously script from a scriptable or automation, synchronizing it, and, and, and the reduction of just manual overhead so that it becomes a more automated part of your workflow. Want to stand up a new API? Great. Here's design pattern one, two, three, four that we've used before. We can simply bring that to bear for this new API that, that matches that variant of expectation. So let's take a look at what the gateway does in terms of providing for the agility of API security. We're going back to the no code policy, you know, deployment stuff. How does a gateway work? What is the difference between what a gateway does in the agility of security versus sort of other traditional components? Let's break it down in terms of really looking at the flow, the information flow from client to an API to the back end. What a gateway does is it is it first it intercepts this. One of the important distinctions on API security is that an API security component is actually presenting itself as the API. It is a termination point, what's called a protocol break. Protocol break, deep content inspection. So we're, uh, as an API gateway needs to basically uh, terminate the connection and, and present itself as the API, the abstraction layer from the actual API itself. The reason for that is because you need to take a look at and inspect the critical parts of API security. Content-based access control. What kind of information is allowable to this API? Is it a SOAP API? Is it a, a mobile API? Is it a web portal? And well, what kind of information needs to be enabled and, and needs to be allowed to communicate to, uh, to that infrastructure? Uh, in order to confine it to the expectations of what the, the API service 
was designed to receive. The enforcement of that allows for clean message patterns and the assurance that the information flow uh, protects those APIs, protects that infrastructure uh, in, in only receiving the data and information that it, that it expects. And looking at that in terms of the context of that information so that the more you know about the services, the more uh, uh, actual refined you can be about this. Agile security and security could be you know, coarser grain or finer grain depending on what you know about the service. You may only know that we're going to allow XML data, uh, which is fine, uh, but you also may know, well, it's this kind of XML data or this kind of uh, HTML transactions or this type of SOAP. And the more you know, the more you can constrain at that central location to ensure that the, the, the information flow aligns with the expectations content types, information structures that your API expects. And doing that and vetting it before it gets to that uh, service, because by then if it's not in the right format, it's not the right stuff, it's too late. Uh, so doing that up front from a security perspective, looking at that but from a content, now the authentication, role-based access control, taking and, and unifying the consumption of those different token formats to determine who the user is, uh, who's authenticated. Uh, and whether they're authorized to access that information uh, or submit that information, that file, that binary, that, uh, that uh, inbound uh, data uh, that's coming into the environment uh, as well. Once that passes the checks, then you're effectively simply brokering on behalf of that. So the, the, in both of these cases, you touch nothing on the client and you touch nothing on the service. The key to API security is that abstraction layer allows you to let the services be the services and let the clients be the clients. It's not a redesign, re-architecture, recoding scheme. It's simply an architecture design scheme by which you're uh, centralizing those decision points uh, by which that you can then allow the services and the APIs to do what they've always done, which is the business value of what they're serving and, and providing from a data perspective. So that information flow is allowed to go in once it passes those you know, criterion checks of, of uh, authentication and, and, and RBAC and CBAC authorization. And then, of course, the, uh, the back end uh, API uh, data uh, is going to uh, respond. And the response is a part of this. The, the, the content-based access control is not just disallowing or checking or validating things coming in. It's also about things going back. What kind of information flow is being retrieved by that user, by that particular client? Uh, the identification and authentication uh, and authorization feed in not only on request, but also on response, because you, you may have restrictions on what can be viewed or seen on response information based on who you are. And so marrying together that identity with the context of the information flow that API data flow over that API is inspected in both directions so that you can protect uh, information coming in and information going out through that uh, ability centrally to correlate the data with the user. Um, and that ultimately comes into play the, set of the SSO session tracking. Once we get to that point, great, the user's valid, everything's fine, let's go ahead and build a, a, a single sign-on token to enable that user to either access this service again without re-authentication or other services that it's been federated with uh, to allow it to access as well now that those uh, basic uh, notions were achieved. All of that foundationally gets us to the point of uh, where we started, um, which is ultimately how do we then have a five-step process to achieve this notion of agile API security. So the way we usually do this and focus on this in terms of uh, uh, finding the niche and, and doing this successfully is start out small. You may have an environment with hundreds or, or thousands of APIs, depending on how big you are as an organization. Maybe you only have a few. But the way to do this is to focus on uh, how uh, a, a few APIs uh, are, are, are exposed. So start out small with this and look at you know, maybe a couple of REST APIs, maybe a web portal, you know, maybe a few SOAP services, whatever that is, and, and focus on what that uh, pattern looks like. What, who's consuming it? Where does it go? and gather up some of that data. Okay, where, where's my endpoint? Here's my service, lives over here. Okay, 
uses SiteMinder or uses Tivoli or it uses LDAP or it uses an Oracle, uses a database. Gather up that information. How much do you know about that service? Maybe you know almost nothing. That's just a web portal. We don't know what it does, but we want to put some authentication on top of it. Uh, well, it's a it's a it's a SOAP service, and and we've got a, a schema, so we can apply some some basic level um, schema checks and, and and structural validation. But you know, we don't know from a business perspective what it does. So you figure out how much you you might know about that API. Uh, and, and, and that can define then as we build policy how fine grain or coarse grain we want to be in terms of the content level uh, access control provisions to build. So that's our first step. And this is, usually takes, you know, we've got some time estimates here. You know, you take about a, a week's worth of time to kind of put together some of the, the basic principles of, of what you've got out there from a, from a flow perspective. Then, of course, the purpose-built technology is to let Sentry do those things that Sentry does. All of that unification of authentication, authorization, single sign-on, uh, content-based access control, role-based access control, uh, let it do it for you so you've got to get that in place in order for it to do those functions that we have spoke of in terms of API security. So deployment can be in the virtual form factor, uh, hardware or software. Oftentimes it's software, so you just a simple install. Uh, got a deployment time of day here. It usually takes a few hours. Maybe, a, you know, actually it's a, usually measured in, uh, in minutes uh, for, for the most part to get, get software installed or a, a VM uh, OVA deployed. But now you've got an instance. Now you've got yourself your, 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 your platform uh, by which to uh, to build upon to achieve that abstraction of, of, of API security. Then we've got to build some of those policy templates. Uh, depending on the kind of service, well, if it's a SOAP service, we'll build these SOAP templates. And if it's a mobile service, we're going to going to you know build some different types of content templates and if it's a, a web portal you know maybe we, we build some different based on the content and expectation of of the data flow and that's done through through interface design through either graphical interface or or a restful and provisioning interface but ultimately the the the, the, the building and, and testing of those policy templates again for the most part I'll point and click there's no code so here we come back to Building this isn't a coding exercise. It's merely a an exercise to bring to bear the kinds of policy decisions that you want to make. What kind of authentication do you want to have? Okay, let's uh, let's create that authentication. Point and click. What kind of authorization? What kind of content is allowable? Do we want to enable single sign-on in federation? All of those are simple policy decisions that that you bring together in policy templates, policy flows uh, as the staging point to enable the API security paradigm. Then you want to plan for sort of centralizing the deployment process. Uh, you don't want to basically you know, go out and, and work on a, uh, an instance of the, of, the gate, of the API gateway that's going to be uh, you know, handling the traffic flow. So usually you'll do this in an ecosystem where you can test and validate it and utilizing what your expectations are for global device management. Are you going to promote those policies manually? Uh, create scriptable deployments. Um, clearly you want to have a versioning process so each iteration of those policies can be versioned alongside the, the APIs so that you know what, uh, you know what kind of versioning you can roll back and all those kinds of things. So preparing sort of that notion of okay we've got our our architecture ready, uh, we've got a product technology ready, we've got our planning, we know what pieces and how they fit together, um, our deployment process uh, set up and, and ready to go. Well, then the next thing to do is uh, well, on that deployed sentry, we need to take that policy set in question and, and deploy it out. Uh, simply push it out through, again, automated REST provisioning or global device management promotion. This is all automated, completely automatable, again, or, or point and click. Here's the policy set, push it out, Sentry receives it, ready to go. Now we need to put it in the path. And this is really uh, obviously not usually a physical exercise, it's a logical exercise. It's merely a matter of now taking that and abstracting the communication pattern so that those, those APIs are, are fronted uh, by, by Sentry. And this is usually just a virtual IP change, DNS change, because all this really is is an endpoint uh, that uh, clients are communicating with. Often there's a load balancer in the equation, so you're just changing a virtual IP or a DNS entry uh, 
And then it's oblivious. The clients are still communicating with the API in the same manner they always have. They're, they're, they don't know there's an intermediary in Sentry, and neither does the back-end system. So the deployment and enablement requires no implications whatsoever on client and service. That's the whole key to this. Whereas you enable the flows without having to impact uh, client or server side of the, of the technology. And uh, so the deployment of the policy and enabling that policy flow. Now, as you then grow the ecosystem, now you've built this initial sort of reference architecture. Now that you can you can continue to on ramp uh, services and, and and new APIs behind those those base policies. The the delta becomes much smaller. Oh well, we've got six other services that are going to behave very similar. Okay, let's let's start bringing those uh, into the mix. And and slowly and surely you become you you build that now agile API architecture where you can build any kind of service, legacy, modern. And, and ultimately, it, you come now to the ability to handle an entire spectrum of different internet-facing or, or, or you know, client-facing uh, technologies and data formats to bridge and broker to data uh, and API and services um, within various types of uh, uh, the infrastructure in a centralized component, old and new services through uh, the abstraction of API security. Uh, agile API security in, in, in that technology component that's purpose built and designed by intent to serve that purpose on the network to extract those functions and enable a, a centralized approach to achieving that agility of API security um, through that abstraction and through that uh, in, uh, uh, purposeful uh, uh, pieces of functionality that uh, that can be uh, brought to bear with with simple uh, point and click policy provisioning, and so that's fundamentally the foundation of how we get there. Um, so uh, that effectively uh, concludes the um, webinar in terms of the overview. Happy to uh, answer any questions. I know it seems like wow, uh, five steps. It can't really be that simple. Well. Yeah, we provide uh, free trial downloads. It is, uh, uh, we provide uh, that in order for you to see it for yourself. Um, we have 100% deployment success of this product over 13 years. Um, so we've been doing this a long time. Uh, and the re reality is, is these principles and these concepts that I've provided today are built upon uh, successful deployments. These are built upon actual real world environments running uh, in these uh, types of scenarios today. Um, so we really encourage um, you to see for yourself uh, uh, and, and go up to uh, our website, download a trial, contact us, we'll walk you through this, give you uh, proof of concept and showcase how really truly achievable this is and how uh, quickly you can uh, re recognize and realize uh, the value of an, a an agile API security architecture uh, in your environment. So again, happy to